السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي يجيبني حين أناديه ويستر علي كل عورة وأنا أعصيه ويعظم النعمة علي فلا أجازيه الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أنبياء الله وعلى سيدهم وخاتمهم حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين My community members in Orange County and all the Muslims worldwide Congratulations on the first day of the month of Ramadan 1442 Today, Tuesday was the first day of Ramadan in California and we celebrated the arrival of this month with passion, with happiness, with joy, with anticipation a month that we wait for it because it carries many bounties, many blessings many mercies from God the gates of paradise, the gate of mercy are wide open during this month. And the gates of punishment and hellfire are shut down. It does not operate. It is suspended during this month. And that is the biggest gift. And our Lord, our merciful Lord is awaiting a cry from us. He's awaiting to hear our voice to listen to our voice, to listen to our supplications, to look at our prayers and our fasting and our dedication. And from all that, he wants us to be better human being, more humble, more sincere, more honest, honest with ourselves and honest with others. This is the reason why we fast. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ in chapter 2 in our book, كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ Fasting has been prescribed upon you as it had been prescribed upon communities before you. The previous religions, they, all, they also had to fast, to observe the fast. لَعَلَّكُمْ So you may attain reverence. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ And reference here to be more honest, to be more honest with yourself, with people around you, to speak the truth. Don't manipulate religion. Be honest with yourself and others. That is why we love the month of Ramadan. It will provide us a unique opportunity, a sincere opportunity to be with our Lord, to revisit ourselves, to look at our weaknesses and failures, and try to stand again, gain the strength and the energy and the guidance through reading his books. Take care of the Holy Quran during this month. Respect this book. Keep this book with you 24 seven. If you have time at home, if not at work, even if you are driving, listen to the Qur'an. At least one juzuk, one section of this Qur'an has to be honored and read and understood during the days and the nights of this month. Don't forget the dua. We have beautiful duas. Don't forget your relatives. Don't forget the poor and the needy. Don't forget the sick. Check on them. Reach out to them. Help them. Spend more time with your families. Spend more time with your kids. Cut back on your work because you are not going to go hungry. Because you are working throughout the whole year. This Ramadan, cut back a little bit on your work. Dedicate the rest of the time to your family, to your community, to yourself. To build yourself. Spiritual upliftment spiritual refreshment, spiritual building. This is what we need nowadays. So congratulations to all of you, my dear brothers and sisters. And we will be with you, God willing, inshallah ta'ala, 
every night at 9 p.m. on this channel to discuss an important issue about our faith and our relationship with God and with mankind too. And therefore tonight, the first, the second night of Ramadan and the first day, the, today is the first day of Ramadan, Tuesday, April 12th. And th this night is the second night of Ramadan. So let me discuss with you an important subject. Since we the Muslims who live in the West, the Muslims of the West, the Muslims of America, American Muslims, European Muslims, we live in a society where the vast majority of people are not Muslims. They don't even understand Islam. So the question is, how does Islam, how does this religion Islam perceive mankind and perceives the non-Muslims? What do we think about them? What is our stand vis-a-vis -vis the non-Muslims? Should we love them? Should we hate them? Should we cooperate with them? Should we get isolated from them and segregated from them? What is it? And then where is it in the Quran? Show me. We need to use this book. Ramadan is the birth day, the birth month of this book. Shahr Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Quran. It was during the month of Ramadan where Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, received this book altogether, altogether, from A to Z. The 114 chapters arrived during the month of Ramadan upon the heart of the Prophet. So we must really understand this book. Our goal in this life is to understand this book and then implement it. And if we don't really understand it, we would never be able to implement this book. So where is it in the Quran I can find the answer about my relationship and your relationship with non-Muslims. So, in Islam, the main perception, the main notion, the main op opinion or impression about man, and when I say man, it means male and female, both, is that he or she is honored and protected and respected in the eyes of God. In three departments, three main departments, a human being, regardless of his or her religion, regardless of his or her roots or culture, is honored, protected, and respected in the eyes of God. In three important departments. One, al-hayat, life. His blood is protected. His life is sanctified. This is number one. He cannot be murdered or physically abused in any way. Every single drop of a human, be it Muslim or non-Muslim, be it believer in God or a disbeliever in God, an atheist who does not even recognize God, but his blood or her blood and her soul, his soul and her soul, his life and her life are protected and respected in Islam. So this is one department. The second, Ahluhu wa irduhu, his family and his reputation too also has to be protected, even if he's a non-Muslim. Even if he's a non-Muslim, his family, his children, his reputation is protected and honored. And that is the second department. The third one, my friends, is his or her property and wealth. The wealth of a human being by simply being, being insan, being a human, you don't have to be a Muslim. You don't have to be practicing Muslim. You don't even have to be subscribing to any religion. Even if he says, I am, I am 
not religious and I don't know God. But he's a human being. Protected in three departments. Nafsuhu, damuhu wa nafsuh. Arduhu wa ahluh. Maluh. His life, his family and his reputation and his wealth. They are protected in the eyes of God. Now, when we read some, the work of some Muslim jurists and exegist commentator on the Quran, such as the books behind me, one of them is Mafatihul Ghayb, that is the greatest Sunni tafsir written by Muhammad ibn Umar, Al Fakhr al Razi. He's Iranian. Iranian from northern Iran, from the Caspian Sea, from Mazandaran. But then his father moved to Tehran, to southern Tehran, Ray, the city of Ray. And he died 606 Hijri, almost 800 years ago. He has written one of the best books of Tafsir. But when you look at his book and other books, I just mentioned one name as an example. And you look at other books, you find something surprising and shocking too. It tells you that only the life, the family and reputation and the property and wealth of a Muslim is a protected. But if that person is a non-Muslim, he has no rights. You find it in these books. With one exception. The exception if that non-Muslim is Dhimmi or Mu'ahad. Dhimmi means he's a non-Muslim but living under the protection of the Islamic society. A non-Muslim living under the protection of the Islamic society. He has entered. Mu'ahad means he had entered into a treaty, a covenant with the Islamic government or the Islamic society. Then again, his life, his wealth, his family and reputation are also protected because he made, he made a deal with the Muslims. Otherwise, otherwise, if he's a non-Muslim and he lives elsewhere, then he's not a protected. He's not honored. This is what they say in their books. But my friends, if we come to the open-minded Muslim scholars, if we come to the progressive, intellectually progressive Muslim scholars, we find otherwise. We find that many of them emphasize that all human beings are honored, protected, and respected, whether they are Muslims or non-Muslims. As I said, by merely and simply being human, insan, automatically you receive this immunity and this protection. You don't have to believe in God. You don't have to believe in any religion. Of course, if you have more piety, more righteousness, more sacrifices, more services, more faith, then your honor is getting higher and higher. But that does not mean if you don't have faith in God, you are not honored, you are not muhtaram, respected. You still have some level of respect, as we're going to see from the Quran itself, from the Quran. We show evidence from the Book of God. I'll share it with you momentarily. So, the opinion of the first group of the scholars, where they say only Muslims and only those who entered with them in a treaty or covenant is respected. The rest are not respected, are not defended, are not protected. This is simply, simply an opinion of a human being. It could be right, it could be wrong. It's not one of the fundamentals of religion. Let me clarify one thing. The opinion of any scholar, any scholar, Accept the Imam, the infallible Imam and the Prophet. The Prophet is the leader, the infallible Imams, the Ma'sumin are his successors. Put those aside because what they say, they represent God. 
They have been ordained by God. They have been chosen by God. The rest, my friend, the rest of the scholars, their opinion is not sacred. Their opinion is an ijtihad. Ijtihad means he did his best to the best of his effort, to the best of his knowledge. He reached this verdict, this conclusion. It could be right. It could be wrong. This is why we have different opinions, different opinions. And sometimes they contradict with each other. Sometimes they are in conflict with each other. Sometimes a scholar rejects, vehemently rejects, rejects the opinion of other scholar. What does that mean? It means it's not sacred. It's open for discussion. It could be yes, it could be no. It could be true, it could be false, because he's a human being. So Islamic fiqh, Islamic law, Islamic jurisprudence has been constructed by humans. Those humans could be right, absolutely right. They could hit the target. They can come up with the right answer. And sometimes they could be wrong. They could be wrong. This is why they differ among themselves. If they were always right, then there is no reason for them to differ. Now, the first evidence from the book of God that very clearly states that every human being is protected and honored by God, regardless of his or her religion, faith, affiliation, doctrine, culture, color, language, doesn't matter. God does not look at these things. Is verse 70 in chapter 17, Surah Al Isra, or Bani Israel, the children of Israel, because it begins by saying, "Wa ila Bani Israel fil kitab la tufsidunna fil ardi marratin." Begins with the story of the children of Israel. So some people title it as the children of Israel. Others they say Isra. Subhan alladhi Asra. Is the nightly journey. When you travel at night, this is Isra. Okay? In that chapter, if you open that chapter, Al Isra, verse number 70, you come here to this verse. وَحَمَلْنَاهُمْ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ وَرَزَقْنَاهُمْ مِنَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَفَضَّلْنَاهُمْ عَلَىٰ كَثِيرٍ مِّمَّنْ خَلَقْنَا تَفْضِيلًا Indeed, indeed, وَلَقَدْ Indeed, we have honored the children of Adam. It didn't say we have honored only the Muslims, only the Shia Muslims, only the Sunni Muslims, only the Sufi Muslims. It never said we honored only the worshippers or the religious. It's very open. Walaqad, indeed, we have honored the children of Adam. And all mankind are the children of Adam. All of them. So this is the first evidence. If you open the Tafsirul Mizan, one of the really most sophisticated commentaries the most detailed, the most comprehensive, the most accurate, the most well-researched commentaries on the Qur'an is this book, Tafsir al-Mizan. I know most part of it has been translated to English. It has been written originally in Arabic, then it translated to Farsi, to English, and maybe in other, other languages, written by... Allama said Muhammad Hussein al tabatabai an iconic figure, an iconic figure in Islamic thought, Islamic sciences, Islamic philosophy, Islamic jurisprudence, Islamic exegesis. So here, when you come here, he says, وَبِلْ جُمْلَةِ بَنُوا آدَمَ مُكَرَّمُونَ The children of Adam, regardless of their religion, they are honored by God. Honored means respected. Honored means protected. Honor, honored means their life should not be spoiled. The blood should not be spoiled. 
They should not be killed for no reason. Number two, their families, their kids should not be abused. Their reputation should not be tarnished. And their wealth and their property should not be appropriated or confiscated with no reason. And then he comes here, he says the Qur'an has two things. He says, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا So we have takreem. Takreem means honored. We honored the children of Adam. But then after that, وَفَضَّلْنَاهُمْ عَلَىٰ كَثِيرٍ مِمَّنْ خَلَقْنَا فَضَّلْنَاهُمْ in Arabic means we favored them above other creatures. So he comes, this is a great scholar, said Muhammad Hussein al-Tabatabai. He says, إِنَّ التَّكْرِيمَ يَتَنَاوَلُ نِعَمَ الدُّنْيَا وَالتَّفْضِيلُ يَتَنَاوَلُ نِعَمَ الْآخِرَةِ There is a difference between takreem and tafdeel. Takreem means we have honored. Tafdeel means we have favored. And there is a difference in the meaning. Takreem means we have bestowed upon them the blessings of this life, lower life. Tafdeel means we will bestow upon them the blessings and the bounties of the hereafter. If they are believers, of course, in that case. Okay, so that is the first verse in the Quran. Non-Muslims are like Muslims. They are protected. They are honored. They are respected in the eyes of God and in the Islamic law. Contrary to what some jurists and scholars believe that as long as the person is non-Muslim, you can take away his wealth from him. You can occupy his house, his apartment without his permission. You can usurp his belongings from him, his money, his wallet, take it away, his bank account, because he's not a Muslim. This is what they believe in, many of them, many of them. But then when we come to the really progressive and open-minded and pious and intelligent scholars who understand the Qur'an very well, we find otherwise. We find different story. We find that God says mankind, regardless of their religion, should not be harassed. I protected them. I created them. No one has the right to harass them to disrespect them, to take away their belongings, their wealth, their children, their families, their homes from them. The second rational evidence, my friends, is the concept of divine justice. We in the school of Ahlul Bayt, the Imami tradition, the school of Ahlul Bayt, believe that after monotheism, Tawheedullah, we believe in divine justice. That God based his kingdom, his business, his relationship, his affairs, his creation on the principle of justice, al adlul ilahi. Whereas others, such as Ash'arites, in the Sunni tradition, do not believe in divine justice. Why? Be they say, they argue, they argue, this, uh, they argue that God is above the law. So he has the right to punish any person for no reason. And he can reward any criminal for no reason because he's above the law. In the school of Ahlul Bayt, the school of the Prophet and his family, we say that does not make sense. God himself is not above the law. He created the law, but he doesn't put himself above the law. And he does not do something foolish because God was the one who promoted, created justice. God is the one who's asking us to be just. Imagine a father of a family, he has 10 children. He says to his kids, hey kids, smoking is dangerous. You should not smoke. If I catch anyone smoking, he or she will be punished. Only me, I can smoke. What would you say about that father and that family and that system? The least we say it's corrupt. It's corrupt. 
This father is corrupt. He's crazy. He's asking his kids not to smoke, but he says, this rule does not apply to me. I'm an exception. If smoking is dangerous, then it is dangerous for your kids and for yourself too. If zulm and wrongdoing is bad, then it is bad for mankind and for God too. Therefore, God says, stay away from wrongdoing. Stay away from zulm. Stay away from aggression. Stay away from crimes. And therefore, he doesn't himself commit a crime or aggression or injustice. We read in Surah Al-Hadid. Surah Al-Hadid in the Quran is verse 57. Ayah number 29. Powerful statement. God says, I created this universe. I sent books, scriptures, prophets, apostles for one reason. لِيَقُومَ النَّاسُ بِالْقِسْتِ that people would uphold justice. لَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا رُسُولَنَا بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ وَأَرْسَلْنَا وَأَنْزَلْنَا مَعَهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْمِيزَانِ لِيَقُومَ النَّاسُ بِالْقِسْتِ So people would uphold justice. So how come God, He is above the law and He can commit any injustice, it's okay for Him? He wouldn't do that. Does not apply to God. When it comes to non-Muslims, my friends, let me show you one of the most important chapters in the Quran, Surah Al-Muntahana, chapter number 60. Read from verse number 7, 8, and 9. If you make some time tonight, before you sleep, read these three verses. In chapter number 60, Surah Al-Muntahana, God says to the Muslims, take it easy with non-Muslims with your neighbors who are non-Muslims. Bear with them, be tolerant. Why? Because one day maybe you're going to change them, change their hearts, change their minds, change their beliefs, and you can win them, win their hearts. Asa Allah an yaj'al baynakum wa bayna alladheena aadaytum minhum mawadda. It may be that God will forge affection one day between you and between them who are non-Muslims. So bear with them. Don't treat them with harshness. Do not retaliate against them. Be patient with them. Then God says, لا ينهاكم الله in number eight. لا ينهاكم الله عن الذين لم يقاتلوكم في الدين ولم يخرجوكم من دياركم أن تبروهم وتقسطوا إليهم إن الله يحب المقسطين God does not forbid you with regard to those who did not fight you, those who are non-Muslims in your neighborhoods, in your country, in your society, who did not fight you on account of religion and did not expel you from your homes, from treating them righteously and being just toward them. Truly, God loves the just. When you uphold justice, God loves you. When you don't commit wrongdoing, aggression, injustice against any person, any person, then God will love you. God says you can, you, you, you can fight only those. إِنَّمَا يَنْهَاكُمُ اللَّهُ عَنِ الَّذِينَ قَاتَلُوكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ وَأَخْرَجُوكُمْ مِنْ دِيَارِكُمْ وَظَاهَرُوا عَلَىٰ إِخْرَاجِكُمْ أَنْ تَوَلُّوهُمْ وَمَنْ يَتَوَلَّهُمْ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الظَّالِمُونَ God, let me read it from the book. God only forbids you with regard to those non-Muslims who fought you on account of religion and expelled you from your homes and supported your expulsion from befriending them. Whosoever befriends them, they are the wrongdoers. So God says, if there is a non-Muslim, your neighbor, your co-worker, your friend in the street, a stranger, who did not fight against you on account of your religion, he didn't expel you from your land, he didn't hate you, he says, be kind to him. Do justice to them. Be nice, be kind. Accept them, help them. You may be their friends. 
you become you maybe become their friends nothing wrong with that islam is not a religion based on racism or aggression or prejudice or pride or arrogance islam is the religion of a humanity islam a religion came for the entire mankind islam is not a special club for a few people islam is not an arabic club He's not for any specific race. He's for all races, all colors. And then we come to the riwayat, the hadith, Kitab al Saduq, Kitab al Tawheed al Saduq. Imam al Sadiq says, Al Muslimu man salam, salim al nasu min lisanihi wa yadih. The true Muslim is the one that. All people and nas, not just Muslims, Muslims and non-Muslims, are safe from his tongue and his hand. Means that he never abuses anyone. Then we come to the practice of the Prophet, Wathiqatul Medina, the Charter of Medina, the Constitution of Medina, the Treaty of Medina. When the Prophet came from Mecca to Medina, and this happened during the very first year of the Hijrah, freshly arriving to Medina, year year 622 CE the Prophet drafted a charter called the Constitution of Medina emphasizing religious coexistence because there is a multi-religious community in Medina not just Muslims there are Muslims there are Jews there are Christians there are atheists there are others not only Muslims so the Prophet had to ensure freedom of religion for all. And therefore he says in that charter, see what the Prophet says, وَإِنَّ يَهُودَ بَنِي عَوْفٍ وَيَهُودَ بَنِي النَّجَّارِ وَيَهُودَ بَنِي الْحَارِثِ أُمَّةٌ مَعَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Wow! Wow! Powerful, my friends. The Prophet says those Jews, the tribe, the three tribes of Jews in Medina, who did exist at that time, Bani Auf, Bani Najjar, Bani Al Harith, they are like a nation with the community of the believers, with the Muslims. Lil Yahudi Dinuhum Walil Muslimin Dinuhum. Jews enjoy their religion and religious practices, and Muslims enjoy their religion and their religious practices. Illa man zalama wa athim. Accept the one of them both. Muslims and Jews who commits an aggression, an act of aggression and wrongdoing, then he is liable for punishment. Otherwise, other religions enjoy their religion. Nobody is going to harass them. Nobody should harass them. It's a multi religious society. They worship side by side, they live side by side, they coexist side by side. So the Prophet was the first person in Islam who established interfaith coexistence interfaith relationship so that's the example of the prophet the example of imam ali imam ali wrote a directive to malik al ashtar malik al ashtar was a military command co commander imam ali appointed him as the governor of egypt but unfortunately he could not rule because he was assassinated by muawiyah bin abi sufyan in year 37 hijri so before sending him to Egypt, Imam Ali wrote him a directive. Ahdul Imam Ali ila Malik al Ashtar. There is a golden piece in that, my friends. You must memorize that. You must memorize it. You must show it to your non Muslim friends. Imam Ali says, Oh Malik, when you go as a governor, treat people equally, including the non Muslims. Treat them equally with the Muslims. For people are of two types. Either you're a brethren in faith, or if not, they don't share faith with you, they are your counterpart and you're equal in creation. So you must respect them. This is Imam Ali. In conclusion, my friends, in conclusion, Insan, by simply being insan, being a human, is protected honored and respected in our faith regardless of his or her religion 
We don't look at people's religion. We don't treat people according to their religious identities or religious beliefs. We treat them nicely because they are human beings. Now, if they are more committed to God, the value goes up in the market. But if they, are, they don't know God, they don't recognize God, they still have value. They are still protected under an Islamic system. They should not be abused. They should not be harassed. They should not even be cursed. Their property is protected. No one can steal from them. No one can use fraud against them. No one can take away their possessions. They, are, they should live in peace, whether it's Islamic society or non-Islamic society. Let me conclude with one story of Imam Ali alayhi salam in this book, Wasail al-Shia, written by Hur al-Amali, Lebanese scholar who moved from southern Lebanon, came to Khurasan, and he's buried there. Muhammad ibn al-Hassan al-Hur al-Amali, his book, Wasail al-Shia, one of the main references of hadith, the hadith. See what he says, the story of Imam Ali alayhi salam with a Christian in Kufa. Imam Ali was the reader. The hadith, the, the, the volume is uh, 15, 15, volume 15, page 66. Hadith 19996, if you want to check it out later on. Okay. Marra shaykhun makfufun kabirun yas'al. Faqala amirul mu'mineen ma hadha? Imam Ali was in Kufa walking in the market. He saw an old man asking for help, for money, begging. Imam Ali said, what is this? It hurts. It hurts when you find people asking for food. They shouldn't ask for food. We should give them the food. We should reach out to people before they ask. So Imam Ali was angry. He said, Ma hadha? Qalu ya Amir al -Mu'mineen. Look at the stupid who were with him, around him. Some of the stupid and naive. They said, oh, oh don't worry, don't worry. He's, he's not even a Muslim. He's a Christian. Why do you bother yourself? Ya Amir al Mu'mineen Nasrani, he became even more angry. He said, Fakala Amir al Mu'mineen, Sta'mal Tumuh, Hatta Ida Kabira wa Ajiza Mana Tumuh, and Fiku Alehim in Baytil Man. This man, when he was young, you used him, you used his energy, his talent. And now that he's retired, he's no longer able to work. You abandoned him? You made him beg for food? You have to run a salary for him from the treasury, from the Islamic treasury. He's a human being. This is the lesson we learn from the Prophet, from Imam Ali, from the family of the Prophet Ahlul Bayt, and from the Holy Quran. That in the eyes of God, every human being is respected. Friends, friends, listen to me. When you want to help someone, don't search for his or her religious identity. Don't. Help for the sake of God. Help because that person is a human. Is a human. Don't help him with conditions. Oh, only if you believe in God. Only if you are Muslim. Only if you are Shia, I'm going to help you. If not, I'll let you die. Don't do that. This is an Islamic. And this month is the month of mercy. The month of Rahmah. The month where we beg God for his mercy and protection. Therefore, therefore, we have to help others and reach out to others. May Allah accept your fast, your a'mal. Please, the remaining of tonight, read some du'as. Dua Abu Hamza Thamali is a beautiful du'a. If you can read the translate, translation too, it will be even more wonderful and inspiring. I leave you with the protection of God. I'll see you, God willing, inshallah, tomorrow at 9 p.m. Pacific time. Allahumma khfar lil mu'minina wal mu'minat wal muslimina wal muslimat al ahya'i minhum wal amwat wa ajjil fi faraj qa'idina wa imamina sahib al asri wal zaman wa ila arwah al mu'minina wal mu'minat thawab al fatiha ma'as salati ala muhammadin wa ali muhammad wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.